Well, it's going to take up a lot of the screen, unfortunately. Okay, so um, Coulomb's law. You guys remember what it is? It's the law that opposites do what? Opposites attract, right? And like charges repel. And um, so opposites attract. And then like charges repel. And then um, Coulomb's law depends on two things. It depends on how big the charge is. And um, the bigger the charge is. So let's say, for example, I have a 1 plus and a 1 minus charge. So like sodium and chloride, the attraction between those two ions will be a certain value. But if I do magnesium and chloride, right, there'll be more attraction because there's more positive charge to attract the minus charge. So this, draw, this attraction is stronger just because of the amount of charge. The other thing that matters in Coulomb's law is how close charges are. So if I have a, a point charge here and it's like positive and I have a, a negative here, I'm sorry, another, so these could be like ions, right? If they're this distance apart or if they're this distance apart, this is a weaker attraction and this is a stronger one that's just a little bit of review and to give you a little bit more detail about Coulomb's law some of this we'll have to know um, for today um, you could also think of it like relationships right and you're in a relationship and you're strongly attracted to each other, or you set, get separated by miles and miles and miles. You know what happens in these long distance relationships, right? The force of attraction often gets weaker and weaker over time as farther and farther apart you get. So, that kind of thing. All right, so we're talking about atomic size. Now, I'll give you the trend, and then we'll explain to you why the trend is the way it is, okay? Oh yeah, uh, you know what? I'm 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 way down in the bottom of my notes actually, but I, I will come back to it because uh, this can all be done separately. So atomic size. So this is the periodic trends part. It's the last part of the chapter. Okay. If if you go along a period going this way, so remember periods go go from left to right. If you go along a period, they get smaller. So yeah, if you actually printed the notes out, uh, this is like the last uh, pages of the chapter, actually. Now, if you if you go along a group, now which way do groups go? They go vertically, right, like this. So if you go along a group, they're smaller up here. So let's think about that for a second, right? So if I have carbon and I have nitrogen and I have oxygen like that, how many electrons does carbon have? We've talked about this before. As how many protons does it have? Six. So electrons for carbon atoms would have six as well, right? So this is six protons. And six electrons. And then nitrogen is what? Seven and seven, right? And then oxygen is eight. Right? So just, it's their, it, the uh, atomic number right, on the top right. And then for the, on the top right of this periodic table. And then the number of protons is six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and going up like so you can, even though when you initially think about it as 
as the atoms are actually getting heavier, like carbon weighs 12 and nitrogen weighs 14, oxygen weighs 16 atomic mass units, even though they're getting heavier, they're actually getting more charge in the nucleus. And Coulomb's law tells us with that extra charge in the nucleus, the electrons get closer and closer to the nucleus. So the size of the atom will decrease because, because the charge, the positive charge of the nucleus is increasing. Now, the other thing you can think about too, and, and I didn't actually get to this part, um, and, and I'll explain it more as uh, when I go back and cover it, but is you notice how I have hydrogen and helium, and then I have lithium and beryllium, and we're going down like this. Right. Remember we talked a little bit about Bohr's model? And Bohr's model was that the atom looked like something like that. Right? This is that, that uh, planetary model. What's happening as you're going from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 is you're going to different, this is 1, this is 2, and this is 3. As you go, as you, as you put electrons into the atom, for example, hydrogen has 1 and then lithium, or helium has 2, but lithium has 3. The reason it's on that second period is you're going into that second orbital around the nucleus. And because the first orbital is is occupied in the middle, they have to go to a further out to, to do the second one. And, then, and likewise, the third orbital, sodium, based on Bohr's model, sodium's electrons are going in here. And just the nature of putting electrons into an atom, once you fill up one layer or level of the atom, you have to go to the next layer, and that's further out. So atoms get bigger as you go down a group, or they're smallest at the top of the group. Okay, so let me define ionization energy. Oh, do, I, didn't do, I don't need to define atomic size. Right? Normally people kind of get that. It's like how big the atom is. But the ionization energy, usually I have to define, it's the energy... I got an extra letter in there somewhere. How do that again? Um, required to remove an electron from an atom. Energy required to move an electron from an atom. Okay, look at, again, carbon and nitrogen and oxygen, right? Who is it going to be harder to remove an electron from? And based on, and based on here, let's just zoom into here, based on those numbers there, who is it going to be harder to take an electron from? What's that? Oxygen? Yeah, why oxygen? Yeah, stronger attraction, more protons. So the stronger attraction, right, means ionization increases going this way. And it's for the same reason the radius is smaller. The radius is smaller because the electrons are more strongly attracted, right? The atom is smaller because the electrons are more attracted, so it's also harder to remove the electrons at the same time. What's going to happen along a group? Top of the arrow, is that going to be lower or higher? Higher. Higher because, right, the electrons are closer to the nucleus. And Coulomb's law says, right, the closer two objects get, 
this guy here. The closer two objects get, the stronger the attraction is. And so as a result, here it's strongest up here. Now, metallic character is kind of a hard thing to define. Um, oh, let me put some notes on the strongest because the atoms are smallest. Atoms are smaller. And the electrons are more strongly attracted. What are some of the properties of metals? You guys know? Or, you guys know some of them just default. How do metals look? Shiny? What else? Conduct good conductors of heat and electricity, right? And so when you look at those things as a group, it's the properties of metals, right, that sort of we characterize as metals. Like, oh, this is a metal because it's shiny, good conductor of heat. It's malleable and ductile. We talked about that. You're able to form foils out of it. That's the class I'll be teaching second half of the summer. We're just taking a slow walk with this class. Hey, you find where you're supposed to go? All right, so um, they're so young to me. It's like all high school students. So I walked in first, like this morning at 8 o'clock. They're, they're all so happy at 8 in the morning. Like real college students are super grumpy at 8 o'clock. They're like, dang it, I need my sleep. Give me some coffee. These guys are all like, oh, we're all excited to be here. <laughs> Don't tell them the truth. They can learn it on their own. Okay. So um, metallic character, right? So along a period and along a group, the simplest way to put it for me is like this. Um, bottom left, like going this way and going this way. This is most metallic. So most metallic is over here. So those are the periodic trends that you need to know, and we need to do. I'll, I'll I'll do some practice problems with you, but what I want to do is do this, and then I'll explain that. I'll explain that uh, metallic character thing and how you can tell where the most metallic things are. So if I make a summary periodic table like this, all right? This is, okay, so that's what my period. That's my periodic table. It's like what it's become, right? Smallest is up here. Highest ionization energy. And then this is the most metallic. And, and the trends go along this, this in that direction. Increases up and to the right, or metallic character increases left and down. So they're opposites of each other. And, and you can actually, the metallic character thing, if you forget, right, you can, you can remember it like this. Where are all the nonmetals on the periodic table? If you look up here, where are the nonmetals? Top right. Where are all the metals? Bottom right. So that's the trend for metallic characters. So the most metallic elements are actually like these ones that are down here. Even though you know you don't normally think of like potassium calcium as being a metal. Remember when I showed you sodium the other day? We cut it open and it was shiny on the inside. It's also super reactive. That's why you know, that's why I did it down. It's actually even more reactive if you go down the group. 
So if I threw, uh, that was a piece of sodium. If I threw a piece of potassium in there, it's even more violent. And if I put something like cesium in there, you can't get transium in those quantities. So if you can get cesium in those quantities, it would have literally blown up the whole beaker. You can look up the videos of people throwing cesium in water, they blow up the half of the Pretty impressive. Yeah, I wouldn't do that to you. She's like, no, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, so most metallic is the bottom left. And you can see the pattern on the periodic table. So I'll give you some examples, okay? I'm going to give you a couple of uh, practice problems. And I'm just going to fill it in over here. I don't think I need a whole other page for this. Which of these, we're going to do trans, right? Small. Which is the smallest? And I'm going to give you pairs, and you have to tell me, okay? So I'm going to pick a pair. I'll do uh, SI and S, which is smallest. S, right? Why, why is that? I mean, because it's to the right, right? So if you know the trend up and right, S is to the right, so this is the smallest. Let's do, uh, let's do uh, SR and MG. Which one's the smallest? MG because it's further up, right? Smaller atoms at the top, so MG is smaller. So that's how we use these trends. So you can predict which is going to be smaller, which is going to be larger. Now, I could have asked the same, used the same elements and said, which has the highest ionization energy? And what would you have said? You would have said, well, S and Mg would have had higher ionization energies. And if I said, which of these is most metallic, you would have just circled the other ones. Because metallic properties go the opposite of, of ionization energy and, and atomic radius. Uh, so let's pick, we'll do one more. We'll do uh, indium and let's do chlorine. Chlorine, yeah, because it's up and to the right. As long as you go that way, it's easy to make the prediction. If you go down and to the right, you can't predict because the trend doesn't follow that. So, for example, if I gave you aluminum um, and, let's say, bromine, right? If I did this and this and ask you which is smaller, I mean, I would guess aluminum myself because the si I know the size differences in the radius as you go further out. But for you guys, I mean, that's just like, I don't know. You don't, there's no good way for you to know that okay? because the trend doesn't go from the top right to the, I mean, top left to the bottom right. It goes from the bottom left. So this one is the kind of question you should be none of the above. That's one of those. Or can't determine based on the information that you have. Okay. Go back. And we're going to try to watch this video. I don't know if it's going to work, but we'll see. Um, yeah, we'll just see how it goes. But one of the things that we were talking about Bohr's model again, and, and we talked about this the other day, is Bohr, Bohr's model helped us understand line spectra. And, and the reason it helped us to understand line spectra is because when you have a model that looks like this, Electrons can only go from, let's say, here to here. That's a fixed amount of energy that comes out. So there's some light that comes out of here. But it's a fixed amount of light, so it's a very specific wavelength. And so when you were looking through those glasses and I showed you those lights, right, you only saw specific lines. And what those lines corresponded to is electrons going from higher energy levels to lower energy levels. And because there's only certain orbitals available to the electrons, right, they can only give off certain amounts of energy, of light. 
Now, um, let's see what else I want to say about that. So what does this mean, quantized? Right. Quantized means can be described by discrete numbers, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And in Bohr's model, the discrete numbers were this 1, 2, 3. And then it went out 4, 5, 6. And he had all these orbitals, just like, you know, we have 8 planets or 9 planets or maybe 10 planets, depending on which astronomer you talk to, right? Each one of those would be orbitals or orbits that the uh, electrons could go in. And roughly speaking, on the periodic table, those orbits are represented by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So this is the beginning of something called quantum mechanics. And it's not... The idea, all it means is that energy is quantized into these whole values. It's not a topic we can really get into in this class, but there are some interesting things. And I'm hoping to show you this video just to give you like an idea of what it is. Um, we'll see if it runs though. Uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna have to go over to here. Hang on. I was looking up something else. Um, just a bunch of these kinds of videos. I kind of want to show you this one from the Royal Institute, but it's about atoms. I'm going to show you this one for atoms, but I'll tell you, it all, it's, it's a better video. The rocket equation is a beautiful thing. No astronaut wants... So I don't know if you can hear that well enough. I'll try to get it cranked up a little bit on this end. It's not, might not be loud enough. to explain to you what's known as the central mystery of quantum mechanics. Well, Richard Feynman, the American physicist, said this is the central mystery of quantum mechanics. There's lots of weird stuff that goes on in the quantum world. Hit you with this and it basically tells you what it's all about. It's called the two-slit experiment. Is that loud enough? I'll start with this. Imagine you have charged this up the other day. I think the battery already died, though. What's that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not loud enough. Down. Oh, no. That's this. Oh, yeah. I have a source of light shining against the screen with two slits. Now, for the pedants in the audience... So... What he just said is you have a source of light and you're shining it through two slits. So this is what light does. He's going to start, start with. Let's go from there. This source of light has to be monochromatic light, light of a particular wavelength. Well, whereas, of course, a light bulb is white light, and that's made up of all the colors and spectrum, lots of different wavelengths. But imagine this is just a single wavelength of light, and you can see the light is coming out in, 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 in waves like, like ripples in a pond. That's the nature of you know, wave-like behavior. As the light hits the screen, it squeezes through the two slits. And each slit, in turn, on the other side, becomes almost like a new source of light. And the light spreads out. It diffracts. And as the waves of light overlap, they will interfere with each other. So where a crest hits uh, a trough, they will cancel. Where a crest hits a crest, they will amplify, and so on. And so on the back screen, you end up with what's called an interference pattern, a, a, a series of light and dark fringes that cancelled out or worked together in phase. That's fine. That's okay, so let me explain that to you because that's like a, maybe a new concept for some of you guys. 
Oh, quantum um, mechanics. That. So what he's talking about um, is that that when you have light, I left a little room here for this. When you have light, it comes in like only twenty five minutes here. You have light; it's a wave. So we talk about light being a wave. It has a wavelength, right? And it has a frequency. So if two two waves, right, come together, and they're going like this, right? What happens is, and and this is zero for both waves. What happens is these two will add up. So I'm going to add them together, and I'll get a wave that looks like this. It just gets twice as big. So, like, for example, if you're in a bathtub, like when you were a kid, you were in a bathtub, and, and you're, you're splashing. And, like, if you were like me, I had, a, I had a sibling who was one year older than me, and we would splash in the bathtub. And every once in a while, one of those waves would go crazy. Actually, all of them went crazy, and they would get out of the bathtub, right? What's actually happening is as you're making these waves, they eventually they add together, so your wave goes like this, and then your sibling's wave goes like this, and they hit, and what happens is all that energy adds up and it shoots out of the bathtub. So when you see that shooting out of water from a surface, that's what that's caused by. It's called two waves in phase, hitting each other, and then shooting up with the extra energy. But here's the other thing that happens that is a property that's unique to waves is that when you bring two waves together and one is like this and one is the opposite what you get is you get a flat line so the two waves will actually cancel each other out and the surface of the water for example would be smooth now i have i brought i bring these because i ride my bike and i listen to it but they have the switch on them and if I hit that switch, right, and a little green light there, what it does, it does noise cancellation. Anybody know how noise cancellation works? Or heard of noise? Who's heard of noise canceling headphones, right? A lot of people have. And they're cool because, like, I can sit in here and I can listen to music and I don't have to listen to that vent, right? What this has is it has a microphone built in right here. And what that microphone does is picks up the sound. And what is sound made of? Anybody know? Waves, right? It picks up the sound from that vent and very quickly creates the opposite sound. It sounds the same to your ear, like if the two weren't there, but when this is high, this is putting out a low. And it's actually doing what you're seeing at the bottom here. And that's how it can effectively get rid of the noise that's in the headphones is by creating the opposite sound and then canceling it out. And this is known as destructive interference. Now I'm not gonna ask you a lot of stuff about quantum mechanics like this, like most of the stuff on the video, I'm not gonna test you on, but it's such a cool thing. I thought we'd waste a little bit of time and watch it. Because it's not, I don't think of it as a complete waste of time. A little bit of time just to see what it, it what, what happens when you uh, do the same experiment with atoms and electrons. Okay, so think about an atom, right? An atom's a particle; it has mass. Think about an electron; it's also a particle, and it has a mass. Now they do the two slit experiment, just like you do with with light waves, or you could do it with sound waves, or you could do it with water waves. They'll do the two slit experiment, and they'll do it with electrons, and they'll do it with atoms. And let's see what happens. So any questions? <coughs> and I could uh, also, I can also do this. It, it likes to, it picks the same language every time alphabetically. Let me just turn it That's the property of light that goes back over 200 years that we've known about since the early 19th century. Imagine doing the same experiments again, but doing it not with waves, but with particles. Do it with grains of sand. So this is the same experiment, but I've tipped it 90 degrees. Rather than waves that are spread out that wash up against the two slits and squeeze through, here you've got individual particles of sand, and each particle would either go through one slit or the other. And so you see they will sort of drain through and you get 
two bumps underneath each of the slits. So the two peaks is reminiscent of particle-like behavior, whereas the, the multiple pattern of interference is wave-like behavior. What now oh, for the with each other? So without or waves, but with particles. Do it with grains of sand. So this is the same experiment, but I've tipped it 90 degrees. Rather than waves that are spread out that wash up against the two slits and squeeze through, here you've got individual particles of sand. And each particle will either go through one slit or the other. And so you see they will sort of drain through and you get two bumps underneath each of the slits. So the two peaks is reminiscent of particle-like behavior, whereas the, the multiple pattern of interference is wave-like behavior. What if we do the same experiment with atoms? Well, uh, so imagine we have an atom gun, something can fire uh, atoms, a, a stream of atoms. You can't see them because they're very small. Let's block off one of the two slits. So these two slits are, are you know, the, the, the dimensions and separation of the slits is, is, is chosen appropriately to, to show us uh, how atoms do things. And so far, so good. Nothing strange here. You'll see a lot of atoms hitting the back screen. So this will now have to be some sort of photosensitive screen where, whereby when an atom hits it, it'll give off a little flash of light to say the atom has arrived here. So the atoms are arriving as these little pinpricks of light that we see. Of course, a lot of the atoms will be blocked by the first screen. They won't go through that slit. Uh, but those that do get through to the other side, you can see there's a bit of spreading of, of, of the atoms. But if we didn't know anything about atoms, you say, well, that's fine, we can understand that. Um, some, a lot of the atoms are going clean through the slit. Some are sort of maybe bouncing off the edge of the slit, and so they're sort of being deflected a bit, which is why you get a bit, a bit of a spread. The first mystery of quantum mechanics comes when we open the second slit. Because now we see something that's very much like the interference pattern we got with light. Rather than having two bands of, of, of uh, spots where the atoms have gone through the two slits, it's as though the atoms have gone through the slits behaving like waves. And, 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 and you get interference of the waves and you get these bands. If we know nothing about atoms or quantum mechanics, you could try and rationalize it and say, well, you know, maybe atoms behave in a very strange way and um, only a certain number of them are allowed to all sit together. And so, you know, me and my gang, we're all going to go on this slit. No, sorry, no room for you. You go to the next slit above. And by the way, there's this rule that no one can go in between the, the two bands, but a few naughty atoms do. So there's a bit of a, a scatter. You know, we don't, there could be very some. British. Not forces between atoms that make them coordinate their actions in a way to give this pattern. That's not mysterious. That's just, we just don't know how atoms do things. But we can be clever and we can force the issue. What if we were to not send the atoms all through at once, but send them through one at a time? Leave enough of a gap for the atom to get through to hit the screen. Of course, as I say, some atoms will um, hit, the, uh, hit the, the, the first screen and not get through. But those that get through will hit the back screen. So let's run the experiment again slowly. And gradually, you'll see, as the atoms go through, they'll be, look like they're just randomly arriving on, on the other side. You keep sending atoms through one at a time, and gradually, that same pattern appears. So each atom by itself is somehow contributing its small part to the overall wave-like behavior that we see in the interference pattern. How does it do it? How, how, how does, we know the atom is a tiny localized particle. We can't see it. It's too small to even see under a microscope. We're firing it at the, the, the screen with the two slits. Some moment later, you see a flash of light on the back screen. It's arrived in a localized point. It's not spread itself out. You don't get sort of like a wash or sort of a, a faint light across the whole screen. It's a little point. The atom is localized. It's arrived in a certain location. And yet, it somehow seems to have been aware of there being two slits, not one, because it's given rise 
to this interference pattern. How does one atom do that? Does it split in half? Does it become like a, a cloud that goes through both? Well, we can try and be even cleverer. What if we were to spy on the atom and see where it goes? You can gently just observe which slit it goes through. So you put a detector just above the upper slit that will flash or beep whenever it sees an atom go through that top slit. Sure enough, you fire the atoms through one at a time. 50% of the time, the detector will beep. The other 50% of the time it doesn't, the assumption being that the atom has gone through the lower slit. But of course, I've been cheeky here. I haven't shown you the results of the experiment. That's what you get. 50% of the time, it beeps, and you see a spot arrive adjacent to the upper slit. The other half of the time, it doesn't beep, but you see a spot arrive at the lower slit. So, yeah, it's picked out the atoms that have gone through the upper slit, and not the ones that have gone through. So each atom does go through one slit or the other. But that's a different result to what we had earlier. So here's the last bit of sneakiness that we can play with atoms. Surely now, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get to grips with it. Leave the detector there, but just very quietly go and unplug it. <laughs> Don't let the atoms know that you're not spying on them. Make them think that you're still detecting them. So, yeah, 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 okay, we're going to run the experiment. Atoms, okay, get ready, one at a time. We're going to be checking on you. All right, so run the experiment again. <laughs> now, if you can explain this using common sense and logic, <laughs> do let me know, because there's a Nobel Prize for you. Quantum entanglement is the idea that particles, however far apart, that's a fun. Uh, that's a fun lecture series. It's, uh, the Royal Institute is RI, and so they they, they do these um, lectures in there all the time. But they they're famous for doing the Christmas lectures, and they every Christmas they do a they hand out tickets to the public, and people can come and hear these talks by famous scientists, and they they bring them to a level where kind of like you know you guys can look at it. And go, oh, I, I kind of get what's going on, but. That sure is weird, right? Did you get how weird that was? Right? You have you have a particle, and you're shining it at a surface, and as it or at slits, and if you look at it, it acts like a particle. If you don't look at it, it acts like a wave. If you put the detector there and you say, "I'm not look, I'm looking at you," and then you don't look at it. It knows that you didn't look at it, and it acts like a wave. So, so the, there's two really weird things. One is, I mean, how does that atom know that that's what's going on? Um, some, this is quantum. This is the nature of quantum mechanics. How does the atom know that you've paid attention to it when it's going through? And the other weird thing is the the atoms are behaving like they're light waves. So when I say, oh, where is this eraser, right, what do you say? It's right there. It's right here, right? You can see it. But the, the essence of it is if it, if it really behaves like the two-slit experiment says it behaves, when you say it's right here, it's here. But if you're not looking at it, it's not right there. Like if you closed your eyes and weren't looking at it, because you're the detector now, right? And I say, where is it? And you're looking at it. Oh, it's right there. Oh, great. And then you close your eyes. It's not there. It's like when you were a little kid and you would get under the blanket and nobody could see you. Right? Kind of the opposite. But yeah, it's that same idea. And this is the nature of quantum mechanics. So here's the problem that it presents, right? Because we're trying to understand where the electron is in an atom. And uh, the answer is... You can't say exactly where it is. Like, you don't know. Because unless you're looking for it, you'll find it. But why is it there? It's, it's only, like, like, let's say you did the experiment like this. Look over here. Oh, there's the eraser. 
Oh, look over here. Well, there's the eraser right there, too. Every time you look for it, that's where you're going to find it. It's weird. So what we do, there's this thing called uncertainty. And this is, the, the rem, this is what comes out of this. Uncertainty is that we can't actually know the energy of an electron or where it is precisely. You just can't know that. You can't know both at the same time. And so we say electrons and atoms and, and lots of things behave as waves. And, you know, if you take Chem 1A, we, we got to go more into the explanations and stuff. And we look at a couple of other strange things that go on. But because electrons have this wave-like behavior, particle and wave behavior, okay, uh, you can't know exactly where it is. So rather than the orbits that Bohr drew, because remember, Bohr's orbits were circular, and according to Bohr's model, he knew exactly at least one dimension of where the electrons were. We can't do that anymore. We can't know exactly where they are. So, we define what we call orbitals. And orbitals are the most likely places you can find an electron. The most probable areas where electrons can be found. It's actually volumes, not areas, but volumes where electrons can be found. They're volumes because, because atoms are pretty much so the orbitals, there's different kinds. The S orbital is the one that makes sense. The S orbital looks like this. It's a sphere. And I can't shade, but you're like, that's a shaded sphere. It's like basketball. Just as a Spalding or Wilson on it, which is the basketball. That one kind of makes sense. Because when we think of atoms, we think of atoms being round. And so that's the one that makes sense. Now, the way they get these, these wave functions is what they're called. Okay, the way we get these wave functions is mathematics. So these are actual equations that give us these. But if you give an electron a little bit more energy, It could also exist in a region that looks like that. So that's like a dumbbell. It's, it's got a sphere on the top and a sphere at the bottom. It's not exactly round, uh, but if you were to sketch like the, the S orbital over it, the S orbital would be like this. It would, it would fit around that same size. But there's also something called a D orbital and the d orbital looks like this. It looks like a clover leaf, but each of the clover's leaves are actually spherical in nature. They're round and they have volume, okay? Spheroid like. Um, there's also one that looks like this, and this one's hard to explain all the time. Oops. One of the d orbitals actually looks like this. It looks like some weird. It looks like a donut that actually has a p orbital stuck in the middle. And and these are the shapes mathematically that we can def, that we determine that the orbitals look like. And we've also experimentally seen these shapes. We can actually see the shapes of the orbitals experimentally by scattering light off of them or scattering energy off of them. Okay. And we can get a, a picture of it. And the F orbital, I don't know if I can draw the F orbital. I should just put a picture there. It looks like a D orbital. Like they're all three dimensional. So yeah, look it up. I can't draw it. It requires drawing skills beyond my level. If it's not a stick man, a box, or a circle, I can't do it very well. So, 
Oh, I can do glassware too. I can go glassware, but you know, it's... Yeah, look up F orbital and you'll see what it looks like. You're not required to know what an F orbital looks like, but you should know what an S, a P, and a D look like. Now, most of the times in books, P orbitals are drawn like this. But they're really not that skinny. They're actually kind of fat. Okay, so I drew it more like it actually looks. An S orbital is a sphere. It always looks like a sphere. Okay. Okay, so, oh, yeah, let me talk about one other thing. So these are called orbitals, so that's actually a term that you need to know. It's not orbits. Orbits is what the planets do. These are called orbitals, and that's where we find the electrons. I'll give you a chance to sketch all that out. So n is 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5, n equals 6. And they're spaced out so that they're close. They're look, it may not look like it exactly, but the top ones are closer together than the bottom ones. Okay, so uh, when we look at the atoms, they're broken up into these... The, elect the space is broken up into orbitals, but there's actually more organization than just the orbitals. Uh, and we know this because, um, because according to Bohr's model, that their, ha their energy levels within the atom, and, and that's what this corresponds to over here. These are energy levels. Um, And n equals 1 is the lowest energy level. And so the energy levels are broken up into subshells. And it looks kind of like this. So here, here is an energy level. There's a subshell. This is the 1s subshell. And we usually designate it with a line. And each line represents an orbital. And when you see the pattern, it's not so bad, but right now it's kind of, I know it's kind of all a little new and foreign. If you go up one energy level, now going up one energy level actually is going to the energy level that contains lithium, beryllium, aluminum, oh sorry, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. All of those atoms have their electrons in the second energy level. The atoms that have their electrons in the first energy level are just hydrogen and helium. Okay. So those are actually the orbitals that are closest to the nucleus. So think about a house, right? Uh, a, a, sphere, a sphere, a spherical house. Right. You're, so you're when you you know you're, you're you're just getting started, they say. Although usually when they say you're just getting started, you've been alive for 20 years and are just getting married, really, but, you know, whatever whatever it is. You have a well, you have a, you you basically you buy one as a portal. It's this little tiny house. How many rooms do you have in your house? Well, you just got the one room because you're poor. You get married. You don't have any. You haven't worked very long. No work experience, uh, and you live in this little tiny. And then what happens? Right? You go along a little further. You start making m more money. And then what do you do? You buy a you buy an energy level two. Right? And energy level two, you generally have more rooms in it. And, and the reason you have more rooms in it is because it's a bigger house. So as the houses get bigger, you get more and more rooms. So if you think about these as houses or hotels, there's all kinds of analogies. What happens in energy level two, not only do you have the 1s, right? The 1s, or sorry, not the 2s, sorry, the 2s. The 2s is a little bit bigger, right? Not only do you have the 2s, you also have the 2ps. When I was in graduate school, I lived in a trailer. Um, well, okay, it wasn't exactly a trailer. It was a trailer home, but it had split it into four apartments. So a single wide trailer, four apartments. And I was in energy level one, because graduate students were poor. And in my energy level one, I had a bathroom, I had a sink, I had a bed, and a shower. 
in one room. It was all in one room. That was my 1S orbital, right? And then um, I got married to my wife, and we got our first apartment, and then we had a bedroom, and then we had a living room, and we had a bathroom. We actually had two bathrooms. That was pretty fancy. And we had a kitchen, and, you know, it had more, right? And that, that, that we were to energy level two. And then we, we, we moved up, but at energy level three, okay, you have a 3S, you have a 3P, and then you have three Ds. Remember I talked about S, P, D, F, right? Energy level four, you get a four S. Then you can also have the three Ps. I don't even have this house yet. I don't want it, it's too big. You have the three Ds, or four Ds, sorry. And then you have the five Fs, and the five Fs go like this. And each one of them is like a room. So, how many of you have siblings? How many kids go to a room? Two, typically, right? Um, when I when I first moved back to the valley, I was like one year old. Um, we had four people in a room because you know we we like just like living really close together. <laughs> But it was my mom and me and my brother and my cousin. We were all in like one room. And there was a bed and a crib, and I was in the crib. So there were three in the bed, me in the crib. And I can remember standing there, seeing all three of them wanting to get out. So apparently I used to crawl out all the time. And like they would find food scraps in my crib because I could crawl out, go eat food, and come back. And I would do that. I was one of those kids. Um, yeah. Anyways. Yeah, you usually put two kids in a room. But if you have an extra room, what happens? What is it? Kids, kids want to get their own room, right? They always want to do that. And it, when you guys get to that point, I'm just going to tell you, make them live together as long as you can. They've got to figure stuff out, just going to say. But at every orbital, if this is like a room, these are orbitals. Okay? Every orbital can take two electrons. So that means at energy level one, that's this guy here, you can only have up to two electrons. So that, that holds hydrogen, because hydrogen only has one. And it also can hold helium. Helium's also in that energy level, because helium only has two. But as soon as you get to lithium, right? Lithium has how many electrons? That's three, so not only do you fill up the lower ones, you have to go to the next room up. You have to put, you'll have, have to put two down here, right, and then to put one in here. So basically, you're just filling this thing up. So this, this leads to something that we call electron configurations. And, and this is the thing that, for electron configurations, this is what you have to remember. S can hold two. So this is the sub, what we call the subshell. The subshell S can hold two. The P subshell, right? If you look just at the P orbitals in the way I drew it, there's actually three rooms like that. So that can hold a total of six. And it doesn't matter which energy level the p orbital is in, they all hold six. So 3p, 4p, 5p, they can all hold six. And then d's, if I scoot down, how many electrons can I can the d hold? If you're looking at the top, right underneath the clock there. You can hold 10, yeah? And then the Fs, I didn't draw them, but you see the pattern, it's two, and then it's six, so it's four more, and then it's 10, which is four more, so Fs can hold 14.
So when we do electron configurations, we're going to put electrons into the orbitals according to these rules and the energy levels. But we're also going to be doing what are called the ground state electron configuration. And ground state simply is the lowest energy state. examples and then you can see how it's done. I do want to show you one other thing though. Um, and th and that's actually just off the periodic table. So S can hold two, right? So looking at the periodic table, how many groups are over here in this bunch? If I'm just looking over here, right? Like you see, you see that there's groupings in the periodic table. There's the left side of the main groups, and then there's the right side of the main group elements, the eights. And then there's the transition elements, and then there is the inner transition elements with the lanthanides and the actinides. So that's what it is. But how many are in this group over here? How many, how many groups are in this group? Two, right? I have, the, I have the one and the two. And then, if I go over here, how many do I have here in this block? Six. And if I go to the transition metals, how many groups within that block? Counting across, right? Three, four, five, how many, how many are there? How many? Ten. How many do you think there are here in the inner chamber? It's exactly those numbers. So those numbers. Now you have to remember, this got created before we figured that out. <laughs> they were like, oh, this goes like this. We think this is how everything lines up. We figured out the atomic numbers. And then they figured out this, and they were like, oh, look, this is where we have S electrons. This is where we have P electrons. This is where we have D electrons. And this is where we have F electrons. So we're going to go back, you know, we're going to go through this once, and we're going to come back through it, and we're going to see how it all fits in on the periodic table. So having said that, there's this thing called the Aufbau principle, and Aufbau is it's just German, Abbau just means filling order. It's the order in which you do things. Very German thing, but, and it's this, it's 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p. That's the start of it, okay? And then things get a little weird, but that weirdness is actually on the periodic table, and I'll show you that in a little bit. So let me just go back up to here, though, because I said 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, and 3p, right? Look at how this chart is. I have 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, and 3p. Okay. That's the order from lowest energy to highest energy. That order is what you're seeing right here. 1s, 2s, 3s, 3p. And then it gets weird, okay? Now, you don't have to memorize this order because you'll be able to do it from the periodic table. But if you want to, for now, write some of that down. You don't need to write the whole thing down. I can do it from memory, but only because I'm looking at a periodic table in my head. Otherwise, I couldn't do it. I don't, I don't have memory to do, remember all that random gibberish. But it is actually part of the periodic table. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to write the electron configurations, and we're going to see where the electrons are in the atom when it's in its ground state. We're going to use the Aufbau principle. This is the order in which we're going to put the electrons into these orbitals. Right? There are exceptions, but we're not going to cover them in this class. We're going to figure out how many electrons we have, and then we're just going to start by filling the orbitals up one at a time until we're out of electrons. For now, we're just dealing with this first column. We're going to do a whole bunch of them down here. 
Okay, first column, we'll deal with hydrogen. Hydrogen's the easiest one. How many electrons does hydrogen have? One. So its electron configuration is 1s1. Let me do that in blue. 1s1. What we're saying is hydrogen has one electron. That electron's in the lowest possible energy level. It's in the 1s orbital. How many electrons does sodium have? Sodium has 11 electrons. So hydrogen had one, sodium has 11. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say 1s2. That's two of the electrons. I'm going to say 2s2, so that's four of the electrons. I'm going to go 2p. Now, how many can I put into the p? Six, right? So I'm going to put six in there because that gets me to 10. How many do I need? I need 11, right? So what's the next one? 3s1. Like that. And that's its electron configuration. All the others are empty, so we don't put anything in there. Okay. So ground state, lowest energy. For excited states, you can have electrons anywhere. But for the ground state, it looks like. Uh, just curious, do, what, what's the relationship between the electron configuration for hydrogen and sodium, if you see it, with the electron configurations? How do they end? S, 1. What group are they in? Group where they have on periodic table. One. Ah, oh. let's do carbon. How many electrons does carbon have? Six. So that means we go one, S, two, two, S, two. That's four, right? How many do I put in the P's? Two more, because I'll give you my six. It's okay to have fewer than six, but you can't have more than six. Basically, what you have is you have this house and it's got all these layers on the inside. You just keep shoving them in. And once you fill up a room, you go to the next room, you fill up that room, you fill up the next room, you fill up that room. Okay. We've silicon. How many electrons? Uh, 14. Uh, I hate counting. So I'm going to go like this. I'm going to go 1s2, 2s2, 2p, what, 6? Now what? That's 10, right? How many do I need? I get the 14, right? So I gotta go 3s, 2. And then what? 3p2. Hmm. Wait, look at that. What do carbon and silicon have in common? Oh yeah. And uh, in the block they're at, right? not the actual group number, but in the block that they're in, when we talk about, about this being separated blocks, what group is it in? It's in the second one. This is actually known as the P block. It's important to know that because you can get, like if you know that's the P block, then you know that both carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, and lead all end in P2. And if you know the last one and how it fills up, you know all the ones before are filled, and you just put numbers in them. Right. It makes it easy to do this. Um, let's do iron, because we've got to do a transition metal. Iron is 26, right? Right in the middle of the periodic table. So... Ready? You gotta go flying here. One s two two s two two p six six. Uh, I better write neater. I'll just zoom in. One s two two s two two p six three 
S2, 3P6. How far am I now? How many electrons is that? That's 2, 4, 10, and 8. So I forgot the 18, right? So 18. Huh, like our gun. Well, you know. And then I'm going to go 4, S2. So I'm at 20. I need 6 more, right? Now, this is when you have to go back to the Aufbau principle. Let's slide up here. 4S2, 3D is the next one. So now it's 3D6. And I can put up to 10 in there. Starting with scandium, well, we're going to count, we're going to get the iron just so you guys can see this. But one, right, for scandium, two, titanium, three, vanadium, four, chromium, five, manganese, six, when I get the iron. All right, and uh, its electron configuration ends as D6. Because this. Right. This part of the periodic table is known as the D block. And I know it's going to end in a D because of where it's at. And I know it has six electrons in there. And if I had been smart about this, actually, what I would have done, I would have written 3D6 first, and then I just backfilled everything else because that's what it is off the periodic table. This is easier and faster ways to do this. So let's talk about sodium, though, before we do the easier and faster. Got three more. We're going to do ions. So what is sodium ion? Right? What is, how many electrons does sodium ion have? Well, it's got 11 as an atom, right? But it has a positive charge. What does that mean about electrons? What's that? I lost an electron. Because remember, electrons have negative charge. So you get rid of a negative charge, they'll have a plus one charge. You, the way I, I sometimes it helps to organize it in your head, you can say sodium has 11 positive charges and 11 negative charges. If I get rid of one of the negative charges, then I have plus one charge. So it only has 10 electrons. So if I were to do that, it would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. That would be. <coughs> That'd be electron configuration for sodium atom, and then oxide, right? Or sodium ion, sorry. Oxide would be O2 minus. So instead of having eight electrons, it has what does oxide have? So eight electrons. It has the two minus charge. How many electrons does it have? 10. You know, that's an ellipsis mark. I mean, just it's the same. Oh, you know. These are said to be isoelectronic. Have the same electron configuration. <coughs> what element has this same electron configuration. Element now, not ion. What element has that? Neon. Neon. What do we know about noble gases? They're super stable. They're very happy with the electrons they have. Right? So we know noble gases are super stable. It turns out sodium ion and oxide ion both form so they can have the same number of electrons as the noble gas. And this is why we get these particular ions. When we do like the when we do nomenclature, we say, oh, the fixed charged ions, we get the fixed charged ions because what they're trying to do is they're trying to be like the noble gas. Yeah. So both of these are isoelectronic with uh, neon. Okay, iron 2 plus. Now, this is, a, this is something I just have to tell you because otherwise you don't know this. 
Um, we did iron already. So I'm going to go like this. I'm going to just rewrite it. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, um, 4s2, 3d6. Okay. And that's for iron. And then I'm going to cross out how many electrons for iron 2 plus? Two. Right. I'm going to cross out two electrons. It's these two that go away. Okay. So it's always the highest energy level electrons. So it's these these electrons in the four in the s orbital that if for the for the transition metals this is true for all transition metals. You always take the s electrons first. Actually, I want to write, I should have, I need to make a little bit more space here, I think, but that's okay. Transition metal. Lose S electrons. That's what that says. Transition metals lose S electrons. So I want to teach you how to do core notation. And let me just explain to you what core notation is very quickly, okay? We're going to take the closest noble gas preceding the element and write it in brackets. So don't worry about this part. I will show you up here, okay? So core, core notation for hydrogen, there isn't one because there is no Nobel gas that precedes hydrogen. It's the first element on the periodic table. But for sodium, if you look at sodium, it's got 11 electrons, right? What's the closest noble gas that precedes sodium? Neon. So this is what you do. This is how you write it, core notation. Neon. And then neon represents that. That's actually what I wrote down here, just so you can see it real quick. Like neon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. When I go up here, I'm just saying that neon represents those electrons. And then you write 3s1. This is by far my favorite way to do electron configurations. Just look at the noble gases right before it and then write it, what's left. Um, carbon, element number six, right? What's the Nobel gas that's before carbon? Helium, right? So, the, you know, this is not like a big savings in time or anything, but you would write it like this. And again, what I wrote on the section before, I said helium is equal to that. here and then goes backwards. And I always get lost when I do that. I just look one up to the right. All right so for silicon, number 14 is neon. So everything in the third period will have neon as its core. And then I write everything else. That'd be 3S2, 3P2. And again, Again, this is what I typed down below. That represents all of that. Saves you a lot of time writing, especially when you get down into the bottom of the periodic table, right? And you're looking at the really big elements like lead with 82 electrons. You don't want to write all 82 electrons. It's just not gonna, not gonna be good. Uh, for iron, What's the core going to be? 
Argon, yeah? Oops. And then 4S23D6. Now, for uh, sodium ion and oxide ion, it could be done two ways, but the core notation for sodium, well, it's just like neon. So is this one. Because we got rid of all those outer electrons. I see. And for iron 2 plus, what's the core for iron? Again, it's argon, right? And then 3D, oops. Normally it'll be written like this, 3D6. So it's the same thing as argon, except now the 3D6s are left. without the 4s, because those are the electrons that we lost. Okay. So questions on that? I still have one more column. We're gonna come back and we're gonna fill the valence electrons in for all of these. Um, or I could do it now. Let's just do it now. Valence electrons. This is an important concept. So now they say, they, there's this old saying, it says clothes makes the man or clothes makes the woman. Why do they say that? What is it, what, what, what's the meaning of that, those phrases? Right. Like I'm not a very good, maybe I am a good example of a chemistry professor, but I'm always a t-shirt and jeans. And I'd wear shorts if I could, but I can't because I work in a lab, so I wear pants, right? I'm not exactly like, when you, when you think about, you'll find out this, generally true for chemists. They wear t-shirts and jeans all the time. But if you go to uh, like Princeton or Harvard, you'll see guys in ties. And even here, you'll see guys in ties. That's kind of what you think of, right? So the, the outer appearance, as shallow as that might be, is what people use to sort of define how they interact with other people. So if I came up to you on the street and I said, uh, can I borrow a dollar? I don't have the money for the bus and I'm wearing a suit. You're going to interact with me different than if I slur my speech and say I need a dollar for the bus and I smell bad. I'm just not saying that you should, but I'm just saying that's the way, it's the, how you interact. So the valence electrons are what determines, it's like the clothes, is what determines how people, how atoms will interact with each other. And those turn out to be the outermost electrons, highest energy electrons of the atom. So for hydrogen, right, it has one valence electron. The reason it has one valence electron, because it only has one electron, it's in, the, it's in the 1s, that's the highest energy level. What about for sodium? Highest energy level is determined by these numbers, this one, the twos, and the threes. So, so sodium has how many valence electrons? But how many highest energy electrons does it have? It's the one. It's the S1. It's, its energy level is three, but the highest energy electron how many does it have? The valence electrons is one. So when I say valence electrons, I'm not asking you for the energy level. I'm actually asking you for how many electrons are in that energy level. <gasps> Darn it, I made a mistake. This is two. I had it right on the left. I just didn't copy right. That's a two there. So how many valence electrons does carbon have? Careful. Energy level two, energy level two. Four, it has four. Oh uh, yeah, I'm being tricky. What about silicon? Four. 
Um, and then we'll, we'll skip the ions, but we'll talk about iron. Iron's a tricky one. How many electrons are in the highest energy level? Looking at the... That notation. Is it 6, 2, 8? Like some people want to say 8, because 4S and 3D, right? Those can add up to 8. Some people want to say 6, because that's the one I wrote last. But which ones are the highest energy level? Which ones have the highest N value, is what I talked about before. It's just these. So it's two. All the transition metals, in fact, will have two. Like that. So you look at the number, that tells you how many there are. Okay. So that makes it all sound very cryptic, and you have to think a lot. It's not true. So uh, sodium had how many valence electrons? What group is it in? Um, carbon has how many valence electrons? Uh, what group is it in? Four. What about, what do you think nitrogen? Now, remember, in, that's the, this is the new, like the, the one through 18. That's the new way people do things. But if you just ignore the tens place and you look at the four, right? Carbon has four valence electrons. So does silicon has four valence electrons. What about nitrogen? What do you think it have? Five. What about the uh, oxygen? Like, uh, fluorine? So the actual, like when you're looking at, I mean, remember, this was set up before any of that was understood. <laughs> For me, that's kind of, I've always thought that's just fast. But yeah, this is actually organized according to the number of valence electrons and the atomic number and the S and the P blocks and the D blocks. The original periodic table that was put together by Mendeleev it was based on reactions with oxygen and hydrogen, and, and it, it grew very similar to what he had here, but he didn't understand like what was going on, because that was well before we had even atomic theory and stuff. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to do some electron configurations from the periodic table. Electron configurations can be out. Um, and I picked magnesium, because I haven't used it yet. I'm going to do magnesium. Um, and we're going to use core notation. So I know magnesium is going to end in S2. And I know it's going to be 3S2, actually. And the way I know that it's 3S2 because it's in the third period. So I go, hydrogen goes 1s, lithium and beryllium, that starts with 2s, sodium, magnesium, that's 3s, uh, potassium, calcium, that's 4s, and so forth. So if I was writing the electron configuration for magnesium and I wanted to use core notation, I would do this. I would draw a block. I would use the, the core. I would use neon. That represents the first 10 electrons. And then I would write... 3s. Then what's the number that goes on to 3s? 2, because it's in the second group of them. Now, if you wanted to write it all the way out, then you would just reverse the process for neon. You would write out neon's electron configuration. Right? But core notation is released. Now we're going to do iodine. Oh, it's way down here. Way down here. 53. So the core is K. Krypton. And then I'm going to start all the way down. I got it all the way back to the left so you can see it. And it's 5. Energy level 5. So it's going to be 5S2, and then it's 4D10, and then 5P5. Let me break that down for you real quick. The S's and P's are always on the same energy level, and the D's are always one lower. Okay? So that means 
if the S's, if the if the S's are energy level five, the D's will be energy level four. If the S's are energy level six, the D's will be five. If the S's are energy level four, the D's will be three. Right. So I summarize that right here. It's N S, N P, and then N minus one D. So whatever N is the period, whatever period it's in. Right. That's how you determine which energy level, which orbital that you're filling the electrons into. Um, what about? Well, let's do another. Uh, let's do another big one. Let's do um, arsenic, AS. What's its core going to be? Argon, right? And then what? Right. It, it's here. So, right, I'm going to be going along that fourth period to get the AS, right? So that means this is 4S2, because it's on the fourth period. And then it's which D's? 3D. And you know, because I'm to the right of the D's, I know that it's full, and I know I can put 10 in there. I'll put 10. And then the P's are, will also be the same as the S's, so it'll be back to 4. P, and then what? How many P? Three. How did I? How did she get three? How did we get three? Because it's in the one, two. It's in the third column of the P block. Okay. Valence electrons is five because you don't count the three Ds. You can also get, and you can just look at it's four S two and three P three. The two and the three make the five. Or you can just recognize that arsenic is in group fifteen or five. Okay. What about cobalt three? What's cobalt three mean? Three positive charge. So that's three fewer electrons. Okay, so this one's a little harder. So what we're gonna do is write cobalt, and then we'll do cobalt three. So to do cobalt, you find is element number twenty-seven. Core is argon again. So this is just for CO. And then it's four. S2 and then 3D, and you can count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Or you can count from the other end and go 10, 9, 8, 7, and get to the same place. 3D7. So that's for cobalt. So I'm going to go CO3, plus, that's the cobalt 3. I have to remove three electrons. I'm going to remove these and one of the Ds up here. And so this will be, I'm removing those. So I get argon as the core. And then I have 3D6 like that. So we did the valence electron thing already. So I'll pass on that and we'll take a break. My to the periodic transient. I think I've covered most of the chapter now. Let's take a 15 minute break and then we'll, actually let's do this. Take a 15 minute break. I'm not sure which room we're gonna go in. They may still be doing their experiment over there because they're trying to get their lab done and their exam done this morning and then they're gonna lecture the rest of the afternoon. So I don't know what room, 15 minutes, that means pack your stuff up just in case, I guess. So we're, we're gonna just finish up the, a little bit of this chapter. We're gonna talk about something called orbital diagrams. Um, and it's based on what I showed you earlier, and then we're going to go into, uh, actually we're going to go into how atoms are actually bonded together and understand what their structures look like. 
So uh, we're going to start with, we're going to do the electron configuration for iron. Iron was, core was uh, argon, this is a Nobel gas before. Uh, and, then, and then we're going to go 4s2 and then 3d6. So we have that. And then to do the orbital diagram, we're only going to represent these orbitals. And we're going to represent them the same way that we did when I first drew them. This will be 4s, and this will be 3d, like this. And remember, the d's are split into five orbitals. Remember, we talked about the blocks and how that all goes. And then, whoa, didn't mean to do that. Then we're just going to put the electrons in. So 4s, we're going to put them in like this. And what, we, what we're doing is we're representing electrons as lines like this. So that's an electron. And we talk about electron spin. Um, don't worry about it. it. It looks like electrons are spinning. Uh, we can't see them, but their properties say they spin. So that's what we're going to do. So this one is spin up. And this one is spin down. Now, remember, this is where we get into the house. I got six children and five rooms. So what did the children want to do? Yeah, they want their own room, right? What did I tell you guys to do, though? Keep them in the rooms together as long as possible. They got to adjust. So one, two, three, four, five. This is what the kids want to do. Now what happens? Yeah, you got to pair one up. Okay. So that's what we call an orbital diagram, where we actually show how the electrons not just go into the SPs, but we're looking S and Ps and Ds and Fs, but we're looking to see how they actually distribute within the orbitals. Later, if you go on, this will explain a lot of different properties, like why is, why, is, why is iron magnetic? It explains that kind of property. Okay. Um, we don't have time to do it in this class, but that's what it would be. Let's do nitrogen. Again, doing core notation, uh, we would start with helium. And then we would go one, uh, sorry, one, 2s, 2, 2p, how many? How many? 2p. For nitrogen. Three. Who didn't know it was three? Most of you just didn't want to say. Because if you didn't know, I want to make sure, like, might as well get it straight now. But the way you do it, right, the way you guys did it is you just counted, right? One, two, and three. So you knew there were three and the P, so it's like this. Now I'm going to do the orbital diagram. So I'm going to go here. So this is 2S. And this is 2p, like that. So the s's, I'm going to put them in. And now again, we're into that situation where we have kids in the bedrooms. And lo and behold, you have three kids. And you just split them up like that. Because they each get their own room. And they grow up spoiled, horrible children. Wait, hopefully none of that, none of you were like that. <laughs> I hope not, anyway. My brother and I shared a room. My mom and my grandmother shared a room. Yeah, oh, great, yeah, farm life. Okay, so um, we're going to do oxygen. And we're going to go two, P, and then how many for oxygen? Four, because you go one, two, three, four, right? So that's the fourth. So we're going to go like this. So again, we're going to go like orbital diagram. We're going to write the two S and the two P's. And we're going to go like this. One, two, and then in the last one's going to be one, two, three, and then somebody has to pair. So they're sharing the room. 
And then only two of them end up being spoiled and rotten. <laughs> uh, just uh, for purposes that we'll talk about this later, right? The paired electrons are these ones, and the unpaired ones are these ones. Just to be clear on what our, our terminology is. But when we go to do structures in just a minute, we talk about structures of atoms and how they bond and form new substances, that's going to become important. Okay? Okay, right, chapter 10. I know there's a lot of words there. What is this chapter? This is the chapter where we actually figure out what molecules look like. Right now in your head, you're seeing formulas. Like, so when I say NO2, what do you see? You see NO2. I mean, you see the letter N, you see O2. You're not thinking like, oh, there's an atom here and an atom there and an atom there. You're not thinking about how they're connected. This is the chapter where we start to understand that. The things that you'll need to know is you'll need to know like how many valence electrons there are because those are the ones, the outermost electrons, where the atoms will react with each other. And then... You also have to keep track of charge. So like if it's a minus charge, you add electrons. If you have a positive charge, you lose electrons, that kind of stuff. And the other important thing that you need to know, and this is from the last chapter, right, is that eight valence electrons is good. Right? Or happy. We say happy. This is where like if you want to think of atoms as being like people. Generally speaking, people want to be, what? Happy or good, right? And that's what we're going we're gonna to do that. And remember, the eight valence electrons mimics the noble gases. And we all know the noble gases are unreactive because they're happy. Okay. And then there's this comment. Remember, this is the stuff I typed. I just didn't feel like deleting it. Uh, yeah, I know. Seems like there should be a lot more. But this is going to explain like how all atoms come together to form molecules. So, what's a bond? All right? And a bond, so we're going to talk about bonding, like how atoms are connected together. A bond is what connects two separate atoms together to form like compounds. Okay? And it's any kind of attraction. Um, and we're going to talk about the kinds, but it, it, in essence, it's anything that holds two things together. That's a bond. So, like, you know, when you have a family, like me and my wife, we have a bond, right? But that's like the marriage bond. But, you know, it's like more than that. We have six children and all that kind of stuff. We have lots of bonds between us that hold us together. Same things, kinds of things hold atoms together. Okay, so let me write, I gotta write the time down here. 13819, so you can find out where it is. So there's two kinds of general kinds of bonds. There's ionic bonds and there's covalent bonds. And ionic bonds generally are found between a metal and a non-metal. And remember when we did nomenclature, we said, oh, we're naming ionic compounds? Ionic compounds are generally held together by ionic bonds. Okay. And it's all based on Coulomb's law, opposites attract. We talked about Coulomb's law a couple of times. Ionic bonds are simply the attractions between positive charges and negative charges. Okay, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. So let's look at um, let's look at uh, sodium. Oh wait, hang on. Let's see. Did I leave something out? No, I didn't. It's later. Okay, good. Sodium chloride, right? What's the sodium ion charge? Plus one, right? And what's the chloride ion charge? Cl minus, right? The attraction between these two ions
Now, let me ask you another question. Let's extend this idea a little bit further. How did sodium get a positive charge? Now, how did it get a positive charge? Because sodium, sodium itself, the element, has 11 electrons in it. Right? What does sodium plus have? It has one less, right? So it lost an electron. How did chloride get a negative charge? Gain. Who do you think he gained it from? From the sodium, right? So think about this. You got two kids, and the little guy has a candy bar, but the big guy wants it. So the big guy grabs a candy bar and takes it. Okay, the candy bar is the electron. What does the little guy do? Fights him. <laughs> Follows him around. Give me the candy bar. It's my candy bar. Right? That's the ionic bond. Like, you took my candy bar. I want my candy bar back. Give it back to me. Right? So, and, and really, the taking of the candy bar, which is the electron, you can see this in the electron configuration. We have, uh, we have neon. This is going to be for, um, for sodium. 4S1. And then we have chlorine, which is uh, neon, right? 4S2, 3, 4, sorry, 3S1, sorry. 3S1, 3S2, 3P5, right? And remember what we said, right? They want to be like the noble gas because the noble gases are stable. So what happens is neon, or sorry, chlorine, will take this electron, and when it does that, it gets to be just like argon, which is a noble gas. At the same time, the sodium ion, right, that's sodium, loses that electron, and when it loses the electron, it becomes just like neon, the noble gas. So both of them get something out of this by one giving the electron away and one receiving it. They both get something out of it, and at the same time, it creates a charge that helps keep them together. Okay. Okay. So covalent bonds. So one type of bond is an ionic bond. That's the unequal, like the, the not sharing of electrons. One of them just takes them, one of them has positive charge, one of them has negative charge. Then there's covalent bonds, and covalent bonds are generally found between nonmetal atoms. So like nitrogen and oxygen, or sulfur and fluorine, or chlorine and carbon, or bromine and phosphorus, or any of those nonmetals, any of the things in the top right hand of the periodic table, those are what make covalent bonds. Okay. So let me sort of briefly explain to you a little bit how this works. Um, let's say now you have two kids that are the same size, okay? And they're bigger kids. And you, you hand them a $100 bill. And so one of them grabs it. What does the other one do? They grab it too. Who lets go? Nobody. <laughs> That they're sharing it. That's the definition of, sh that's not like sharing that you define as a parent. Like sharing as a parent, you say, well, you take 50, you take 50. What the atoms do, they're just like, it's mine. <laughs> and they just won't let go because nobody wants to give up $50. They're just holding on to the electrons. So when we say sharing in chemistry, covalent bonds, that's what we're talking about. And that's generally what happens between non-metal elements. So for example, if I take hydrogen, all right? Now, how many electrons does hydrogen have? First out of one, right? And the other hydrogen has one electron. That's kind of how you visualize the bond between the two hydrogens. There's a positive charge. The nucleus has a positive charge. Right. The electrons are the negative charge. And what happens is the two positive charges surround the negative charges and they just don't let go. They're stuck together because that's the negative charge. 
the secret seems to them. I just decided to do that. Right. Okay, so, um, yeah, let's say you have a covalent bond. We say it's shared, a shared pair. But it's the sharing, like I'm saying, like neither one wants to give it up, so they're really stuck to it. And in ionic bonding, it's really like one says, oh, I could do without this electron, here you have it. <laughs> and the other one goes, oh, thank you very much. And then they're just, they're stuck together because of the charge. Okay. So anyways, yeah, my, my atoms have voices, by the way. <laughs> To talk to each other. To start with, we're going to learn how to do Lewis structures. One of the things I need to teach you is a couple of different kinds of Lewis dot formulas. Okay. So for boron, for example, the Lewis dot formula for boron, it starts with the element symbol. So we're going to do nitrogen. Okay. And it's valence electron. Now, boron is in group 13, so it has three valence electrons. Carbon is in group 14, so it has four valence electrons, right? Nitrogen is in group 15, so it has five valence electrons. So again, the valence electrons, if you can remember the group numbers, or you could just look, uh, that's how many valence electrons. So nitrogen is five. And the way that you do the Lewis dot is, do you sort of imagine that you have a box around here and it has four sides? And you're gonna put the dots in like this, one, two, three, four. And it's just like the whole idea of the bedrooms and the children. They want to stay separate before they pair. And so we'll pair these guys up like that. So that would be the nor way we normally write it. We would normally write it like this. And that would be the Lewis dot structure for the element or the atom nitrogen. Now, the reason we put four sides on it later, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, is because four sides, if you put two electrons on each side, what do you get? Eight. And that's the eight that makes things like noble gases. All the noble gases, like neon, for example, look like that. And that's what nitrogen is going to try to do. That's what all the elements are going to try to do. They're going to try to have eight electrons around themselves to be happy or to be stable. Okay? So we'll stop there. We'll pick it up next time.